My name is Nathan Gallagher, and you're listening to the Step by Step podcast. I'm with my dad, Pastor Jim Gallagher. How's it going today? Wonderful. Excited for our discussion. So we've had episode one has come out, and now we're on to episode two. And uh, you've covered a lot in Step by Step since the last episode, um, all from what is called the historical narrative. This is uh, Joshua all the way through 2 Samuel, which is insane. Um, I'm doing a uh, Through the Bible reading plan currently, and I started in January, and I'm not even through numbers yet. And uh, so here you are, having taught all the way through 2 Samuel. You're crushing it. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Do you have um, a favorite book of any of these, the historical narrative? Um, you know, I think First uh, Samuel, probably, um, there's such a... There, there's there's more positive things that are developing than negative things are, that are developing, which is the first time since Joshua. So, so that's exciting. Um, okay, here's a if you can scan through all of those books in your mind, do you have a favorite one story from all of those books? If there's one that stands out, um, yeah, I think I think you know there's a there's a reoccurring theme that's that's happening and that is that there's a really dark backdrop and tremendous challenges in front and then god is reaching into that and calling people that are going to bring about tremendous influence for the kingdom in the midst of that and so i would say that caleb's story sort of um expresses that so dramatically and that um th that uh, he's he's an interesting guy because he's a peer of Joshua, and just prior to finding out this little vignette in his life, um, God tells Joshua, he says, Joshua, you're old, and Caleb is his peer. So we know, Caleb, you're old, mm -hmm. and yet Caleb has this desire to participate in what God is doing, and he chooses the most challenging area in the whole of the nation. There's this mountain filled with with giants, great opposition. And he says, give me this mountain. And he says two things that are remarkable. Number one, he says, give me this mountain because it may be the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that just strikes me. He's, he's not saying giving me th this mountain because God has made it abundantly clear to me that I'm gonna take this mountain. You know, there's no question we're gonna be victorious. I have the promise of God. He says, well, it might be the Lord. And the only way I'm gonna find out is if I venture out and see if it's the Lord. And then the second remarkable thing in his storyline is he says, he's an old man, <clears throat> and he says, I'm as strong now as I was 40 years ago. Now, that's a lie if his strength is in his, in his own natural abilities. You know, I'm, Caleb was in his 80s. I'm in my 50s. It would be foolish for me to say, I'm as strong now as I was when I was 30, or I'm as strong now as you are. Like, that would be foolish. That's, that's simply not true. I think you're unless, technically stronger than I am now. <laughs> I don't think so. And uh, unless Caleb's strength was not in his natural ability when he was 40. His strength was in the supply that what God would give through his spirit. And so I, I think it's my favorite story because it's going to set up a reoccurring truth that'll be repeated in each Bible hero that we meet through this whole narrative, that each one of them is faced with great challenges, but they sense the call of God, and it might be the Lord. The only way to, to find out is to lean into the strength of God and walk into the call of God. And that, to, that to me, is thrilling because I think that's repeatable. I, I've never been asked by God to take a mountain. I've never been asked to fight a giant but I've been asked by God to do things that are well beyond my natural abilities and without a, an absolute confidence that <clears throat> I'm going to be successful, but I can lean into the power of God and step in to do it. So, yeah. And I think what you, you just with Caleb's story where he says that might be the Lord and then he, he steps out in faith. I think it's encouraging for us who, um, often seek God and are, are figuring out next steps for maybe life or family or where we're going to live or things like that. And it's rare that we can say, I know this is the Lord. Um, most of the time, there is just that sense, that stirring 
that um, it might be God, it might not be God. Um, really, the only way to find out for certain is to take that step of faith and to just say, okay, this this could be him and I'm going to move in this direction. So I think that story, as um, as exciting as it is and heroic as it is, like you said, it, it is so um, relatable to just go, um, yeah, this might be God, and then the same thing. And part of probably a strength, too, is not just in the Spirit of God, which supplies strength, obviously, um, but from walking with God for so long and experiencing the faithfulness of God, you, you kind of get, and maybe I'm wrong here, so you might have to correct me, but you kind of get this sense of like, I can do this because God's going to do it when you're walking with God. And so it uh, he knows it's not his own strength, but he, so much of the faithfulness of God in his life, um, it's like he can, okay, I'm almost invincible because I'm doing what God wants me to do. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's even set that way in the text because it says it, it when it lays out um, to the reader, a reminder of this character, Caleb, we haven't seen him for 40 years. Like he was one of the spies that went into the land and came back with this positive thing. And then he disappears. Like we don't, we don't know anything about him. He's been gone for 40 years. And then we meet him again. And we're told that Caleb has wholly followed the Lord. And so the, the narrative lays out, hey, this guy's been walking with the Lord his whole life. He's been trusting God. So, so you know, like David, when David goes in against the, goes to Saul to say, I'll fight that giant. And Saul says, you're a kid. And he says, listen, I fought a bear and I fought a, I fought a lion. I can beat the giant. It, he can look back over all these years of walking with the Lord and say, well, I can take this mountain because I know God's been faithful to me before. So it's not confidence in yourself. It's confidence in the faithfulness of God, lived experienced in the faithfulness of God that says he's going to keep doing the same thing. Right. And you only know that because you've been walking with the Lord. Right. And I think um, just before we move on, I think that, you know, there's, there's the general will of God that is not difficult to discover. It's written for us in the pages of his word, who God wants to make us, how God wants us to behave, what, what our value system is supposed to be, how we act, how we react, clearly presented in the scripture. The specific will of God as a follower of Jesus and in the decision-making that I face day to day, that is more challenging. And Caleb's story is a great um, uh, illustration for us of, hey, I can do the thing that I think the Lord wants me to do because the Spirit of God is gonna equip me to do it. But I think it should also challenge us to step out of just the idea, I, I think it's, it's important for the idea of, of you know me and my family situation here or me and my relational situation here or me and my friend group here i think it should push us beyond that into what are some adventurous things that perhaps the lord wants to call me into i think one of the things that can happen to us is is our christianity can become um, dreary almost if we're just living out the day-to-day -day life and we're not like Caleb looking and saying, there's a hill there that hasn't been occupied yet. You know, there's a, there's a mission trip to go on or there's a ministry adventure to step into or there's a, a, you know, a, 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 a person to share the gospel with or you know, something that takes us outside of just the, how I'm dealing with my interaction and my social group and what my life looks like. So I think it, should, it, it can help us there, but I think it should drive us beyond there. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a lot of our sort of testing or viewing of what God's doing in our life is measured by maybe our comfort level. So I'm, I'm praying about this next season that's just going to allow for me to be more comfortable, um, whether it's financially or it's relationally, like you're saying. And it seems like a lot of the things that God stirs us into is the exact opposite to take us out of that comfort zone out of what is um makes sense even in our in our day and age and what's important to um, the world around us and god's saying no i'm going to actually take you out of what's comfortable and send you or charge you into something that's going to further his kingdom the work that he wants to do 
and I think give you a real deep sense of satisfaction in life as you sort of remove yourself from those dreary, mundane sort of um, ways of living, which is, um, I think if more people got that sense of adventure, that call to step out of um, just the normal into the things of God, I think they'll find, I know for me personally, more satisfaction, just that sort of um, almost God, uh, that instinct that God created us with to step out and experience adventure um, with what he wants us to yeah. do. And understanding that the the adventure is not for personal gratification, right. but for the furtherance of his kingdom. Exactly. And historically speaking, you know, um, transitionary periods have happened at great cost to the individual believers who stepped out during that time. So that's true in the biblical narrative of the gospel spreading from Jerusalem outward. Um, it's true historically, you know, um, how it, you look at you look at global Christianity today. And it didn't look the same 150 years ago when people from uh, England and America and so, some other European countries looked out at unreached parts of the world and to great personal cost, they were willing to venture out. And it wasn't just for adventure sake. Um, and it wasn't just so they could say, look at what I've accomplished for the kingdom. Because in many cases, their accomplishment was simply laying a brick that the next foot would step on. And so just seeing it as that, it's, it, we want to be able to say, I just, I don't want to just live my, like, Jesus is going to help me just make it through life. I, that's not the message of the Bible. Um, I want to venture out for him, but it's not for adventure's sake, it's not for personal gratification, it's not to, to become a name somewhere, it's for the furtherance of God's kingdom and whatever part I play in that. That's great. So let's sort of transition here and go from your favorite story to um, what I would consider my least, probably one of my least favorite books of the Bible um, is the book of Judges. Now it, it's, I, I think the stories are fascinating. I do think that um, it is compelling but um, it it kind of makes my stomach churn when I read the book. And you mentioned in one of the um, teachings, I think it was Ruth, um, but you mentioned uh, kind of yelling at the TV. And that's how I feel in the book of Judges, where you're just like, are you kidding me? Uh, here we go again is kind of the, each chapter begins the exact same way. Here we go again, people doing what's right in their own eyes, um, following the world around them. And then you see this sort of cycle over and over. And so um, this cycle being, uh, you might have said different, but it, it's kind of the cycle of sin and then slavery and then supplication and then salvation. Is that how you word yeah, Pretty it? much, yeah. What did you yeah. use different uh, letters, sin, I Sin, suffering. I, I, I started all with that. Sin, okay. suffering, supplication, and salvation. You okay. said slavery. So oh, okay. The, suffer the suffering, right. slavery would be a part of the suffering. Right. Um, and so this idea, you, you see the cycle and it's, it's frustrating as it is, um, it is probably more frustrating because it's common and not just common in the biblical narrative, but common in our own story. Um, we see this cycle. One of the things you mentioned as the cause of this was this idea of synchronism. Um, will you just elaborate a little bit on that idea as it relates to judges, the, the idea of synchronism. Well, kind of what we see happen as the, as the narrative happens is that so the the Moses passes away, and Moses passes the mantle of leadership to Joshua, and that's been kind of a reoccurring thing. We we met Abraham, and then the covenant was passed to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and then it seems that that Joseph becomes the leader, and then it goes silent for four hundred years. The book of Genesis ends. And when the book of Exodus begins, you've got this people enslaved and God raises up Moses and Moses becomes leader, not the only leader. He's surrounded by a host of people. Um, but in, in his passing, he passes the torch or the mantle or whatever the leadership, he passes it to Joshua and Joshua carries that um, to uh, the end of his life. But he doesn't pass it to an individual. The, the, they've taken the land now. The land's been distributed among the tribes. They have the law of God to govern and direct them. And, they, um, and, and so they're supposed to occupy each portion 
within the land. Um, and what happens is they begin to compromise and they begin to allow people groups in the land that they were supposed to drive out. And they also begin to look to the nations around them. And so what happens is who God has described himself to be, they sort of take on some of the traits of idolatry and these things mixed together. And so now God and the worship of God doesn't look the way God has designed it. It looks the way they have created it by this, this process. And, and again, the Bible doesn't use the word synchronism, but it's a word today in the business world. And, uh, and it seems to happen. And so they just sort of develop. Here's who God says he is. Here's what we think God should be like. And we mix these things together. So essentially, they, the, they take the God of Israel and we already have up until this point the way that God wants to be worshipped. Um, we see that in uh, the book of Leviticus and Numbers and things like that. And then they begin to worship him like the surrounding nations worship their gods. Um, and as as foreign as this concept seems to us, because um, idolatry in the biblical sense or the Old Testament sense isn't something that we deal with in um, Western civilization and kind of how we exist. But even though it seems foreign, I, I just can't help but think about how we tend to do the same thing, um, where we worship an idea of God, um, but we aren't actually worshiping God because um, God has made it pretty clear in his word how he wants to be worshiped. Um, and uh, both in the Old Testament, like we've been seeing, but also in the New Testament for followers of Jesus, how our expression of worship um, should be, our relationship to him should be. And yet we kind of do the same thing where we, we're no longer um, worshiping God the way that he desi desires to be. Um, worship and I, some of the ways in our our culture we um, especially in I guess modern Christianity um, if we can sort of play the critique of uh, modern Christianity for a moment um, but we tend to worship worship um, and what I mean by that is um, and I was I was having a conversation with our worship pastor here recently on this idea but um, we worship just worship music it's almost like it's not just a vehicle to to praise god we kind of get obsessed in sort of like a, a like a fandom kind of way of worship music and it's not it is and I'm, I'm just kind of caricaturing it a little bit but i do think that this is i think worth talking about but we're so emphasizing the expression of worship or who is singing what song or how it's being done that we're missing out the point of who we're actually worshiping. And so we begin to obsess over worship or we do the same thing like we worship right methodology or um, expression of worship or teaching. And it's not about who, it's about what or how. Um, or we worship like sort of our cultural Christianity, what is going on in our, how we do it, how we express ourselves. And this is the right way. This this way of doing church is the right way. Or And we get sort of obsessed with the the what and the how. And we, we sort of miss the point. We miss the who, that God is who we're worshiping. And he's kind of given us pretty clear um, expectations or guidelines, I guess, of um, how he wants to, to be worshipped. And I just can't help but think when we're, when we're going through the story of the judges, that seems so uh, foreign to us, I guess. But to just insert ourselves over and over in the narrative, both in a personal level where we find ourselves in that cycle of compromise and sin, which leads to suffering because sin always disappoints. And then here we are again, crying out, God, help me, save me. And then the faithfulness of God delivering us over and over again, whether it's through our own circumstances, but then in the same way, adopting or behaving like the world around us and missing out on relationship with God as he 
and tens and as he um, designed for us. And then this behavior uh, led to um, what you you talked about a few things, but this behavior of synchronism and adopting the culture around them led to weakness and spiritual confusion, which then leads to moral decline. So we're, we're not worshiping God the way that he intends for us to worship him. So then it leads to moral decline, which then led and we see in the book of Judges, social unrest. And I think probably this might be a softball, but would you say that our culture has fallen into the same pattern? Well, so if the, uh, um, we're gonna presume historically, um, Samuel has been accredited as being the writer of the book of Judges. So we'll, we'll just assume that. At the end of the book of Judges, Samuel gives commentary it's the final book of the verse, or the final verse of the book. He gives commentary that covers, it's the blanket that covers the whole book. He says, there was no king in Israel and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And that is his explanation for everything that's happened. So people have, they've removed God, they've removed the word of God, the standard of God. And in place of that, we've put my own desires, my own wants, whatever. Um, in our modern culture, um, we would see a, a very, a, a, we would see a clear parallel where in replacement of the standard of God, we've placed people doing whatever is right in their own eyes. And the byproduct in the book of Judges is that there is a degradation that takes place. That's, that's a decline. That's what happens. Um, and so I would say anywhere where we dismiss God and we dismiss the standards of God and people behave however they want, we're going to see this same thing happening. We're, we're not, every generation thinks of themselves as the modern generation and every generation thinks of themselves as what they're doing is brand new. And so we have this brand new social experiment in the Western world where we are completely removing ourselves from any authority of God in our life, any standard that God has given in his word. We're, we're calling that archaic and we're dismissing that. And instead, we are going to live how we want to live. You can't tell me what is right or what is wrong. You know, we have one of the phrases, you know, what is my truth and, and all these things. We're just dismissing that. Um, this is not a new social experiment. <laughs> like we, we, already, we already have all the data. Right. Okay, here's the data. The scientists have, have already done all the research for it. We know what will happen. What happens to a people who behave like that individually and then corporately is that there, there is going to be a national weakness. There is going to be a moral decline. There's going to be spiritual confusion and there's going to be social unrest. And throughout the book of, of Judges, we read about sexual you know, depravity happening in all sorts of horrible ways. We, we read about theft. We read about violence. It's just the nation has degraded because they left God. God's design is to raise man up to the, you know, the highest that, he, that man can live in relationship with God, uh, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, living the way God intends. And when God is rejected, there's that degradation. That's, that's what happens. That's what idolatry does. That's what, that's what atheism does. It degrades us. And so to say, is that a softball? It's like, well, it's true in the West now. It'll be true anywhere. You know, if, we, if, God, uh, if God is patient, and he holds back his return for another hundred years. A hundred years from now, if people do the same thing, it's going to net the same result. So, and there's this, there's this, but there's a sense of like we've found utopia and we've figured it out, and it it almost seems like there's there's zero connection that what we're doing because it looks different that there's zero connection to the book of Judges. Like if you were to talk to, you know, anybody in the West today and ask them, like, do we, if they knew the book of Judges, is our culture today, does it look like the, look like that? We'd say no, like it's completely different. But that, that heartbeat, that sort of um, underlying tone of what's happening is 100% there. And so it's almost like, it's almost like, oh my gosh, like this is, this is what's happening. Um, and so it's easy for us to go like, 
it, kind of scary. Oh man, this, so is it repairable? What do we do? What, what happens? Well, keep in mind the storyline of the book of Judges. So we see the, it, it, it starts out that the people are making compromise. They're not driving people out. They're starting to behave like so. So they, they sin. They turn from God. They get involved in idolatry. And then the suffering starts. And then they realize this is terrible. Look at what's happening. And they cry out to God and salvation takes place. The salvation looks the same every time. The book of Judges um, refers to 12 judges. It's over a 400 per year period of time. It refers to 12 judges. That's 12 individuals that when the people cry out, God looks from heaven and God stirs upon the heart of an individual and equips that individual. And that individual steps up and they're, they're pulled out of this period. Now, while it refers to 12, it doesn't follow the story of all 12. It follows the story of, of six and only really four of them with any sort of color and detail in the storyline, maybe five. And, um, and the longer we get to know them, <laughs> the more their humanity shows up and we realize that they're fallen people just like you and I are. So, so to answer the question, is there hope? Well, yeah, the whole storyline of the Bible is just like we started with, with Caleb. You know, there's these difficult circumstances, great challenges, and there's an individual, in his case, he's an old guy. Um, when we'll get to the book of 1 Samuel, remember 1 Samuel begins in the period of the judges. It's not, the period of the judges ends when Samuel retires and puts a crown on Saul's head. Now the monarchy years begin. That's gonna be about 350 years goes from halfway through 1 Samuel all the way to the end of 2 uh, Chronicles. And, and so there's that transition. But up until that point, the book of 1 Samuel births in the midst of this same degradation that's happening. And we're introduced to a, a woman in a very difficult family environment. Um, her husband, who has some relationship with God, but he's got two wives. <laughs> And, and one of his wives, Hannah, is barren, and she's mistreated by the other wife. I mean, it's a terrible circumstance. And she, she cries out to God, God, would you give me a son? And, and Eli, the, the prophet, sees her and says, God's going to answer your prayer. And she gives birth to this little baby, and, and she wean, you know, raises him until he's a, you know, probably a kindergartner. And then she brings him with his little ephod, like a like he'd be like a Halloween present, dressed up like a priest or Halloween uh, outfit, and brings him to Eli the priest, and he's raised in and around the tabernacle, and and so that marks this tremendous transition that's about to happen, where God is going to rescue and redeem. So so we say, is this possible? Yeah, it's possible because there's a Hannah out there today, like right now. There's a Hannah. There's some woman in difficult circumstances crying out to God. And there's a, there's a, you know, the male version of Hannah, <laughs> you know, some young man or some old man that's just saying their heart's being stirred by God. And they're just saying, God, I just dedicate myself to you. And God, would you use me? And, and as they start following Jesus, their life changes, their family environment changes. They start impacting their neighbors, their friends, their social circle. And God begins to do a work. And revival happens when that happens on a large scale in a small space. Mm -hmm. So that nowhere do we read about universal revival that's happened all over the world. We part, you know, parts of it take place everywhere. Um, but what happens is a whole lot of people in a small expanse of the globe have that happen to them and boom. And then those people start going into the whole world. So, so yeah, is this repairable? I mean, our, our job as followers of Jesus is not to repair the politic of the world. Mm. Our job, that's, that's not our job though. You know, even in the height of, of, of the, you know, the, the height of the Bible in, in the book of Acts when the gospel is spreading and, and in, a, in one sense, you know, Rome is being overcome by the gospel message. Rome's still Rome. Things are actually becoming worse um, politically, socially, economically in the Roman Empire as Christianity is spreading. 
revival doesn't change the politic of the world. It doesn't change, it doesn't change the course of the world. It changes the lives of the individuals who accept Christ and the influence that they have around them. So, so our hope is the same hope that it was in the book of Judges, that there's an Ehud, and there's a Gideon, and there's a Deborah, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the, there's, a, there's a Samuel, and follow him, there's a David, and the story continues. And I think that that's um, a great way to think about it, because I think it's, it's really easy for us to sit around, especially those of us um, that are Christians and maybe been in church for a long time, that we like know, okay, here's what the Bible says, and we look around our world, and, and part of it is heartbreak, ha part of it's frustration, and we're just like, ah, what, what is going on? And yet the solution always is individuals. The, sol the solution always is a person dedicating themselves to God, dedicating their, their family, their house, their what's closest to them to God, and allow that to trickle out. Where, where sometimes we, um, in the negative sense, think too big and think like all of the problem is out there, rather than allowing God to do that transforming work here within me. You mentioned somebody in one of the messages about dry, the circle, the... Um, uh, about revival happening, go into your yes. room, draw the circle. Who Le said Leonard that? Ravenhill. And what was the? So he's he's uh, quoted as saying um, that uh, I forget which book it is that he writes it in, but that he says if you want to see revival happen, go in a room, shut the door, draw a circle on the floor, climb inside that circle, and begin to pray for revival to happen within that circle. Because when revival happens within that circle, then rival, revival can impact outside of that circle. And, and that's exactly, yeah. we see that over and over in the Bible. Like you're mentioning with Hannah and with Samuel and down through it, it's, it's individuals that dedicate themselves to God in a, in a context, in a backdrop that seems like where even is God? And that just begins to bubble up within them and out onto the world around them. And we see that happen. I think there's so much hope for us, whatever our context is, to say, God, would you do that transforming work in me that would bubble over into my family and into my coworkers and into my classmates and, and throughout like that. And, and sense that large scale of hope that we want that sort of bite size is we just say, okay, God, I'm, I'm only responsible for me and I'm going to give myself wholeheartedly to you and allow you to work through my life. And we see throughout um, this, this story in the Bible that God is, is focused on nations and generations and, and all the things that he's doing, but we also see over and over how much God cares about individuals, a single person. And that is... Um, so well put in the story of Ruth, where we see, um, I think, and you really focused on her a lot, but Naomi in this story, um, about God's just care for her story and her detail. And, and um, you called her the prodigal daughter of the Old Testament, where you see her leave where she's supposed to be, in Israel during the famine, she leaves. She goes to Moab with her husband and her sons and kind of just immerses herself in that world. She, it's almost like, I'm just going to wait this whole bad thing out. I'm not going to be a part of any solution. I'm just going to kind of wait it out. And she, she immerses herself into Moab. Her sons marry um, the Moabite daughters. Um, and then tragedy happens. She loses her husband, she loses her sons, and then she realizes there's nothing there for her. So she goes back, Ruth with her, um, Orpah, is that the other? Orpah, yeah. Orpah stays behind back in Moab. And then you see this redemption story in um, through Ruth, but really it, it's almost like Naomi is kind of the, the secret main character of the story as God's not letting bitterness take root in her heart. He's not going to let it happen because he cares about an individual. And um, I think so often for us, we we forget um, we forget that God cares about us as individuals so much. And as focused and as concerned he is um, with the globe, um, he's also he cares about our story. 
And um, I, I think one of the things I, I kind of would like for us to talk about with, with that idea in mind um, is that God tends to allow all sorts of situations and circumstances into our life um, to grab a hold of us. And I can think even in my life, it seems like every type of thing could happen for God to get my attention. Um, are there more ways or specific ways that God sort of chases people down, um, maybe from your own life or, or just speaking on that kind of idea? Because God is is relentless in his pursuit of people, individuals. Um, so are there maybe specific ways or things that God does to sort of chase us down or get our attention? I, I, that's a great question. And I think what a, what a great backdrop, um, you know, Naomi is in the storyline and, and that um, in, in case, you know, listeners don't, don't grasp like the issue of her leaving um, in, in the storyline where there's that cycle it's because Ruth takes place in the in the storyline of Judges, and it's it's fairly it's like a big as a Bible reader, you know, it's like oh the all this terrible stuff happening nationally in Judges, and then it's like okay, let's focus on a family for a minute. Let's talk about these guys, and then Ruth and her husband and her two sons, and there's famine in the land. We know biblically that that famine was not a natural um, consequence of a drought season. It was a byproduct specifically of the sin of the people. We know the cycle, sin, suffering, supplication, salvation. So you had mentioned that she doesn't want to be part, you know, the family doesn't want to be part of the solution. They, they don't look to God. They look for a, a natural solution to a spiritual problem. And that natural solution is there's, there's opportunity in Moab. So they, they head there and things go terrible. It's a terrible, tragic story. Um, and she reaches a point when she decides to go back. Ruth comes with her. She arrives in Bethlehem. All her friends haven't seen her in 10 years. And they're so excited. And they say, oh, Naomi, it's so great to see you. She says, don't call me that. She says, my new name is Mara, which means bitterness. N Naomi means pleasant. She says, I'm not that anymore. I'm bitter. <laughs> but then as you keep reading the story, the author refuses to call her Mara. I love that. <laughs> He's just like, no, you list one person that calls her that. And and immediately when she says that, she gets she gets just pummeled. She begins to get pummeled by the grace of God. And it, it's the only person that calls her that herself. Herself. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then she so they arrive and it's it's the start of the barley harvest. Which what does that mean? Well, it means there's opportunity for her in the law designed for the poor and the stranger to be able to glean on the edges of the field. And the storyline unfolds as Ruth happens at, at Boaz's field and Boaz happens to have an attraction for her and happens to be kind to her. And, and it's just one blow after blow after blow of God's grace. And at the end of the story, uh, Ruth and Boaz are married, they have a child, and Naomi's holding her grandchild. I would say it's just like so beautiful. And so, so I think, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful backdrop to then answer that question, what kind of things will God use to get our attention? And I would say, God will use all kinds of things. You know, I, I have a friend um, who, who, when he came to know Christ, um, his story was, was not my whole world was falling apart and everything was broken. He was at the height of success in his field. I mean, you, you, you really couldn't achieve much more than he achieved. And he looked around and he was like, something's missing. And there were a group of believers that started influencing his life. And he, he came to, to, to the Lord because everything was so good and unsatisfying. <laughs> He comes to Christ. And then, you know, you've got other stories of people on the other side of where everything's fallen apart and broken, and yet God was there for me. And then I'd say the most common would be somewhere in between. You know, my story, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, the, a derelict. My life was, you know, terrible and everything was falling apart. I was super happy and content, senior in high school, and I heard the gospel and the truth resounded. So, so I think that God does and can use anything in our life as a tool to bring us to Christ or to develop the characteristics of Christ in us. And so, so the 
I get, I was going to ask a question, but you just answered it. Um, because it, he does things like that to grab a hold of somebody that is yet to place faith in Jesus. And yet so often as followers of Jesus, as Christians, um, we find ourselves experiencing all sorts of things that are designed or allowed by God, designed by God, um, to mature us or to challenge us in an area or to cause us to let go of certain things, to grab hold of him. Because all of it, I think going back to what you said a few minutes ago about the highest level for humanity, for individuals is to be in relationship with God, living um, in the way of Jesus, producing the fruit of the spirit um, for the sake of our relationship with God and for the sake of others. And so um, the things that that we experience, that we walk through in life are, are part of God's grace to get us to grab, to cling to him and, and draw um, closer to him. Yeah. And I think the story of Ruth is a, a great example of that. Now let's keep moving. Yeah, okay. Um, unless there's, you, there's more. <laughs> there's, there's so much more. Um, in 1 Samuel, we get to a very interesting turning point in Israel's history. Um, we've seen this progression of sin, suffering, uh, supplication, salvation, and then people typically call out to God for deliverance. Um, and God would raise up uh, someone like a Gideon um, or the, the many others in the book of Judges to... Um, do we know, this is random, but do we know the exact time that Ruth would have been, like who would have been a judge contemporary to Ruth? It's it's hard to play. So um, I mentioned there are 12 judges in the book of Judges. Um, it's hard to place them specifically where in, in timeline because it's not laid out. Like, like my brain in particular, I want everything to be in a straight line. And, and I think in our Western thought is kind of that way. The book of Judges is not laid out that way. It's 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 not laid out as this judge follows, this judge follows, this judge. It's laid out to tell a story. And that story is this, you know, doing whatever's right in your own eyes is going to produce this. And in this setting, God is going to raise up and do. <laughs> so is there, who who was the judge when like Moab was a problem, or I guess, would that well, have anything well, that to we, do with Ruth? Um, no, I think that would be, uh, we know, let me, let me say, um, Ehud was the judge that dealt with the Moabites. Um, however, it seems likely that Ehud was early on. Um, and especially because it seems that there was relative peace between Israel and Moab at that time. So they're probably having some other challenge. Um, we do know that Ruth is toward the end of the period of Judges because we know that Boaz and Ruth have a child who has a child who has a David. Mm -hmm. And so we know where she fits is towards the end, but we can't say specifically, oh, this is when Samson was running around or, or, or this was happening. It's, it, um, the, the, the author doesn't put those, those um, tethers of time to hold us to that. So uh, we just can't know exactly. Yeah. I'm just curious if yeah. there was like a, if after chapter seven, you could pause yeah. and read Ruth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think about that yeah. with the Star Wars uh, <laughs> series of, of the best way to watch those. Do you have a, a, a thought on when, when the best way to watch the Star Wars movies are? Yeah, you're asking the wrong guy. Okay. I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah. I just like um, Han Solo. So. <laughs> the 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 self the movie or just the character? No, just the character. Okay, yeah. in like in, the original four in five the five. first movie that okay. they ever made. Um. So, anyways, we were talking about in that time period they are they call out for to God for deliverance, um, and then something changes. In First Samuel, there's the same issues, sin, suffering. They begin to cry out, but rather than crying out to God, they call they cry out for a king. Um, and I, I just my it kind of just again frustrates me, kind of blows my mind a little bit. Why do you think that happened? Because they've seen they've all seen the faithfulness of God, and they've even if they are they're uh, they're not content with following God, and they like their 
their cycle that they're in. They love the sin, the suffering, the supplication. They just think it's fun. Um, they know it works. So why change the formula all of a sudden from crying out to God to say, do you know what we need? It's a king. Yeah. Well, they specifically say a king like the other nations. Mm. So just um, to be like everybody else. Yeah. So I think I, I think there are some variables. I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, again, you talk about yelling at the TV or yelling, like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, but there are some variables that, that I think shed some light onto it. One is this has been a reoccurring thing. And it, and it's, and so it's, it may just illustrate that idea of dependence upon God. That's hard for us. You know, it's, um, in the law, God says you're to have no other gods and you're to have no graven images because a graven image is something that you can hold on to like, and God says, no, 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 you're not going to have this thing to, to hold on to. You're going to have to trust me. I'm the, you know, I'm the invisible God that you're going to have to trust in. You're not going to have a visible manifestation of me. And, and so there, that in that same sort of a broader sense of that would be that idea of dependence upon God. That's hard. It's hard for me. <laughs> like, you know, the Bible teaches us that we're to walk by faith where our whole life we've been trained to walk by sight. Everything that we do, don't close your eyes and walk around the room. Turn the light on when you come into the room. And now we're having to walk by faith. It's a, and so this dependence upon God is challenging for us. So I think that's one side of it. A second thing is what, what develops in 1 Samuel is we get to see, we get to meet um, the last two judges of, of Israel. There were 12 mentioned in the book of Judges, and then there's two mentioned in the book of Samuel. The first is Eli. And Eli, when the story begins, he's, a, he's an older man, and uh, he's a priest and a prophet. And um, the priesthood has become very corrupt. And so the people, when they bring their offerings to the Lord, Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are wicked individuals, and they're robbing from the people. They're 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 taking advantage of women. It's just it's terrible what has happened. So so you have these guys who are the visible representation of God's leadership. Mm -hmm. So we have what you know theologians refer to as this is prior to the judges. So from the, the time of the establishing of the nation in the book of Numbers until the um, end of the judges period, referred to it as a theocracy being ruled by God. And so the way God ruled is he gave his word and then he established this priesthood, these individuals who would represent God by expounding his word to the people and providing the means of this is how you relate to and worship God. Well, it's become completely corrupt. And so, you know, the, the people are looking at, at the situation that Eli's created. And then Samuel, Samuel um, steps on the scene as a probably, I mean, he's probably a teenager, maybe he's 20 when, when Eli passes away. And now he's catapulted into leadership um, as the, this, this representation. And he does a tremendous job, but we read about his kids and his kids have also been corrupted by the priesthood, by that, by that same thing. And, I, and so I think that on the one hand, people struggle with the basic idea of being depending, de dependent upon God. We struggle with that today. Mm -hmm. And then there's this idea, well, if, if this, is what it, this is the theocracy, this is terrible. You guys are all wicked. And so they just look out across the Jordan and they look at Moab and Edom and Ammon. They look north up into Mesopotamia and Syria, down to Egypt, Ethiopia. They go, we just want to be like them. We just want to have a king. And they cry out to the Lord or they cry out to Samuel for a king. And Samuel actually calls him on it. He says, on... On that, you know, time of of you know the coronation essentially of of King Saul, he says, when the people were in Egypt and they suffered, they cried out to God and God brought Moses. And in the period of the judges, they cried out to God and he mentions three judges: uh, Jephthah and Barak and who else? Um, Gideon. He says that you cried out and God brought this, and now you guys haven't cried out to God. You've cried out for a king, and so. This is what you're going to get. And this is what's going to happen to you as a people. There's a, there's a degradation now that's going to happen. The king is going to be like this. And God redeems it. I mean, Israel's greatest history is under their monarchy. 
So God redeems it. He doesn't cast them off because they, well, fine, you want a king, then you're, gonna know, you're not going to have me. Mm. God's going to work through the king. So it's, yeah. it's a picture of his mercy. It is. And, and God remains faithful to his people anyways. And they, they in a, I mean, they do, they reject him. They say, this just hasn't been working for us. And it's, it's funny how we can, we can flip that narrative a little bit where maybe they're seeing that cycle and the problem in their mind is God, you know, rather than their problem going, maybe it's our sin and it's our compromise that gets us into the suffering. But um, so they they reject God and yet God remains faithful to them. He redeems it. And this is so much of the story of God, his faithfulness um, in the inconsistencies and failures of people. And when we look at the Bible um, in these flashes, like we've been doing today, um, we really see this, the faithfulness of God over um, and over. And I think it's encouraging for us that God remains faithful to us even when we're unfaithful to him or, or we God believes in us and is for us even when we don't believe in him and are, aren't trusting in him. But I think for many of us, and myself included, I, we don't want that to be our story. We don't want our story to be, well, God remained faithful to me even though I was faithless to him. I think many of us want to be more faithful to God. How, just maybe practically for a minute, how do we just cement ourselves to be more faithful to God um, despite or regardless of the circumstances that are going on around us? So th that's a really interesting question. And one of the things that we're doing in addition to the step-by-step -step series where we're looking at a whole book in a single setting, we're also doing something that we're calling sidesteps, where we'll sort of focus in on one character or event that happens um, in the storyline. And that, that you're teaching that on Sunday morning, correct? Right? And it's available online on the yes. website. Things yeah. like that. And in the storyline through the book of Judges, uh, we uh, zoomed in on the life of Samson. And Samson is one of the, one of the uh, more well-known Bible characters. But what he's well known for is not really what his story is designed to teach. You know, he's well known as the, as the children's ministry superhero <laughs> that has great exploits and defeats enemies. Um, but in reality, um, we refer to Samson as a life of wasted potential. And I actually used a term, um, I referred to it as wasted grace. Mm -hmm. And I defined it this way, um, Samson, every time he does something seemingly heroic, in other words, the power of God comes upon him, he has this supernatural strength to defeat the obstacle that's in front of him. Every time he does it, he does it to bail himself out of a, a place that he shouldn't be in, something that he shouldn't be doing. You know, he's, when, he's, when he fights the lion, He's in a vineyard, and the and the the Nazarite vow that he took was to stay away from anything from the vine. So he fights a lion in a vineyard. You're not supposed to be in a vineyard, bro. So the very first, and so every scene is like that. And so he experiences this tremendous power of God, the tremendous grace of God in his life, but only to bail himself out of the trouble that he faces. Um, the only exception to that is at the end of his life when he pushes over those pillars where the, the leadership of, of Philistia have gathered together in this temple and that falls down upon them. And, and because their leadership has fallen, um, that gives a reprieve to the nation of Israel from the oppression coming from the Philistines for at least as long as it takes them to reestablish leadership. And so his, his life is in a lot of ways wasted, wasted grace. Now, God's grace is designed to bail us out of the problems that we create for ourselves. If that isn't the case, none of us could survive. I mean, my my as as much as my Christian experience, I, I would hope, has been a, a continual growing uh, over the the past several decades that mm -hmm. I've followed Jesus. I know that my story is also the story of me doing things I shouldn't have done, saying things I shouldn't have said, and and being in need of God's grace to bail me out of my problems. But it's a tragedy when our only experience of God is experiencing His grace to pull us out of problems we created for ourselves. And I kind of painted a picture in that, in that lesson on Samson where you, you imagine Samson sitting around a table with other Bible heroes. 
and they're telling about the experience they had of God's grace. And so Gideon talks about going out into the battle and, and he's got a torch in one hand and he's got a trumpet in the other hand and they blow the horn to announce their presence and shine the light to show the enemy where they are. And yet somehow God gives them victory over the Midianite hordes. And, uh, you know, and then there's Samson. And Samson says, yeah, I was sleeping with a prostitute and God gave me strength to carry the gate that was closed out of the city or to beat up Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. And by the way, I was a Nazarite and I wasn't supposed to touch dead stuff. And so it's just a sad storyline. And so I, I think that maybe to answer your question, how do we go from someone who is only kind of experiencing the faithfulness of God in our unfaithfulness to experience the faithfulness of God in accomplishing that which maybe God put us on the planet to accomplish in the first place. And I think maybe the secret is when we determine that we want to live pleasing to God. When, when I make that my determination and I say, I say I, I'm determined to please God, what's that gonna do is it's gonna narrow my life down, it's gonna give me very single focus. I just wanna do what's pleasing to God. Now I can experience God's grace to help me do that. Because the moment an individual decides that, you're going to suddenly see all the obstacles standing in the way of you doing what's pleasing to God. Maybe in a, in a relationship. You're not married. You're in a relationship. You've been misbehaving in that relationship. But now you've decided that you want to be pleasing to God. And now there's that obstacle, not just of the, the, the temptation that any couple would face, but you have the additional fact that you've invested physically in each other in the past. And now there's these torn feelings associated with the rift that you might have in the re relationship or the struggles that you're going to have through this. How, but you can experience the grace of God to help you do what's pleasing to Him rather than just experiencing the forgiveness because you did what was unpleasing again. And so I, th I think that's a major shift in a person's life. It's that commitment. It makes me think of where we started in the book of Joshua, where Joshua says, um, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And it's this um, personal commitment to just say, whatever everybody else is doing, or what, regardless of what goes on around me, I'm committed first to God. Um, Pastor Pete, one of the pastors here at Calvary, says um, that that helps them determine their Sunday morning, that they've committed their Sunday morning to be at church as a family. And it helps them um, to, Sunday's already decided, they, they've given it to God, they're going to show up to church. And it sort of eliminates the pressure to have to make a decision every week, are we going to go to church or not? I tell students um, in youth ministry that it's about making the decision before the decision. It's, it eliminates the need to have to be clutch because very few of us are actually clutch, um, but saying I'm going to decide now when sort of uh, favors going my way that I'm going to be committed to God rather than in a pressure situation have to stand up in a sort of heroic way for God. You've already made that decision. Yeah, yeah it makes me think of those, those uh, like cooking challenge shows. And so they'll throw out the ingredients on the table and then the chef and all of a sudden they say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a three layer chocolate, this thing, whatever, as if that thought just popped in their mind at that moment, not that they had made that same cake a thousand times. Exactly. It's like I'm able to use this in this weird ingredient and still make something amazing because I've done it a thousand times. Exactly. Yeah, that's and, a great and point. And that, that's, that is how I think daily we determine to, to stay faithful to God is by making that daily decision that I'm going to, just right in front of me today, I'm going to choose to be faithful and um, allow God's grace to supply strength and ability to keep moving forward. Right. I like that thought, but I'm also thinking now about chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a great place for us to stop. Um, I'm going to call it uh, here so we can eat some, uh, go eat some cake. Um, thanks for listening uh, to the Step by yeah, Step. Can I throw one yeah, more thing it. in and just mm -hmm. say, just want to remind our listeners, the whole reason that we ventured in to this project, and that is that we want to do our best to uh, make the Bible as easy as possible. Um, we believe that the Bible is is filled with instruction for our life, guidance for our life, but also that these stories, especially these these old these stories found in the Old Testament narrative, they're, they're designed to light us on fire. 
and to, to thrill us with this idea that God used people in the past and God wants to use me today. And I think listening in as we talk, you know, especially from, this, from the front end talking about Caleb, you can, can tell that story lights us on fire. And so we've just wanted to do our best to make um, these books as accessible as possible. Um, because we know that there there's some challenging things about them. And so the whole purpose of this is to put that in your hands, maybe listen through um, the study on the book of 1 Samuel, get some of the parameters for the book, and then that'll help you glean those truths so that you can live those things out in your life and carry on your part in the story of, of this redemptive work that God is doing in the world. That's great. Because if we can better understand God and His Word, um, we can see what he wants to do in our life. We can find ourselves more faithful to him. And we can, like Caleb, take take the mountain that God has for us in our life. Um, so thanks again so much for listening uh, to the Step by Step podcast. Make sure you tune in weekly for our Step by Step series that happens on Thursday nights here at Calvary. And you can find that on our website, on our app as well as the YouTube page. Um, and then keep an eye out right here for our next episode um, for the Step by Step podcast and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time make sure you like and subscribe share this with anybody that you think might uh it might be helpful for them and if you could leave us a rating um on uh, especially the apple podcast this is how sort of word gets out about the podcast so more people can give it a listen um with that god bless you we are going to go eat some cake